One of the things that we talked about um, when I was pitching that I should be able to speak here uh, was uh, thinking about destructive attacks and to really focus on destructive attacks and what will the next destructive attack look like? I can remember, I'm sure many of you can very clearly, where I was the very second I found out about Shamoon uh, uh, in August of 2012. I remember where I was on June 27th, uh, 2017, when NotPetya hit. I can remember where I was when the Olympic destroyer hit. So um, these things are kind of a big deal when a destructive attack happens. And I kind of wanted to start with a quick quote. I think that this is a really good uh, uh, quote. I love uh, Robert Clark. And um, intelligence is about reducing uncertainty by obtaining information that the opponent in a conflict wishes to deny you. And when I think about why we do threat intelligence, why we do all the research and analysis and reverse engineering, it's ultimately to enable our customers, to enable our organizations, uh, to enable people to be able to better defend themselves uh, from these types of threats and to do it proactively rather than reactively. Going through reverse engineering malware is fun, but it doesn't really help us prevent all of our systems from being encrypted or wiped or whatever it might be. Uh, when I think about the threat actors that conduct destructive attacks and, and really threat actors in general, everything kind of fits into the three buckets that, um, uh, that I think we all use, which is targeted intrusion, nation state, e-crime, uh, which is financially motivated, but now we're seeing kind of a, a hybrid between financial motivation and, and uh, targeted intrusion, and hacktivism, where we also start to see these uh, buckets, which back in 2015, 2014, we're very clearly defined. This is now very murky. Uh, what is the motivation of the threat actor? Um, and what constitutes a destructive attack versus a financially motivated attack gone sideways? Not Petia, a good example. Everybody kind of thought initially that was a ransom uh, attack. And I can remember dealing on an IR and, and talking to uh, uh, some, some counsel and, and lawyers. And they're like, no, this was uh, financially motivated. It's not uh, a nation state. And then uh, a few weeks later, they're like, it was definitely nation state, right? Like, so it, it evolved very quickly. Um, in terms of intelligence, I won't spend much time on this, but really just thinking about all day, every day, there's news. While we've been sitting here, I'm sure many of you saw that there was an indictment against two Iranians for uh, being involved in SAMSAM, the, uh, the ransomware activity. Um, and so even as we sit here and, and, and have these talks and go through these sessions, there's live things occurring. We need to be tracking them and understanding what they are so that we can start to get in front of these attacks. And I'll, I'll kind of walk you through uh, an example of how uh, these things kind of add up and how we can start to think about these proactively. Uh, I'm just going to skip these. Um, I, I thought I had more than 10 minutes, to be honest, when I put the slides together. So. <laughs> it wasn't until I got here and John was like, you have 10 minutes. And I was like, I got 35 slides. <laughs> um, anybody remember this story? Came out in uh, October of uh, last year. And the SBU, the Ukrainian intelligence service, was warning about a new uh, potential attack that was going to potentially disrupt systems or cause damage. Um, and that's kind of interesting. Why would a, a national intelligence service come out and say uh, something to this effect that something might happen, right? That's a pretty, uh, pretty interesting statement. And um, I'll go back to, uh, to Voodoo Bear to kind of think through how the SBU came to this conclusion. Um, there's a, a lot of great researchers at CrowdStrike that uh, actually have done research on Voodoo Bear, which I think you guys call Sandworm and, and other people, I think Kaspersky called it something else. Um, so this, you know, I want to give them credit and also, Black what's that? Energy. Black Energy, yep, perfect. Uh, and also, John, it's, I think I need to talk to you about the, uh, the, my cut, because I have like 30 analysts here. So, um, but uh, yeah, so uh, a lot of great work went into this. But if you look at the Black Energy Voodoo Bear timeline, um, December 2015, really kind of one of the earlier disruptive attacks, the lights went out in Ukraine, huge, uh, huge eye-opening event, right? That was kind of the, the thing that everybody had been warning about, that somebody could get into the power system and turn off the power. Not to be uh, outdone, they did it again the next year. Uh, Merry Christmas uh, to everybody in Kiev. Um, and so uh, 
you know, they've kind of replayed this. And, and the interesting thing in this attack was that they didn't just disrupt the power and wipe logs and evidence behind them. What they did was um, they made it look like a hacktivist. So anybody here who's ever seen Mr. Robot, they use the uh, F society uh, uh, imagery and, and kind of language to make it seem as if it was, uh, in fact, some hacker group called F society. Maybe nobody in Ukraine watches Mr. Robot. Uh, and then the other thing that they did was that they were encrypting files and tried to make it look like ransomware. Now, it wasn't a very compelling ransom note or, uh, or operation that would give us the, uh, the kind of additional evidence to, to support that it was, in fact, financially motivated. But it showed that they were starting to incorporate the concept of Maskrovka and hide exactly who they were and what their intentions were. Uh, in January, we start to see more ransomware kind of coming out, targeting uh, uh, activity in Ukraine. Uh, we see X data being distributed in, uh, through ME Docs. And the interesting thing about X data was that it was rampant across Ukraine for May of uh, 2017. And then somebody posted the private key on a forum, and it said, here is key. Now, I'm inferring that it sounded like that. It was just typed out. It said, here's key. <laughs> but um, you know, it was interesting that it, it almost seemed like the initial test to see if they could do it. Uh, but it didn't spread as quickly or as much as they wanted it to, because they really wanted to cause some disruption. So they released the key and hoped nobody would talk about it. Uh, in June 2017, fake cries distributed, possibly also through ME Doc. Uh, and this is uh, functionally equivalent to WannaCry, just completely rewritten for some reason. Um, but at this point, I think most people had probably patched MS 17010. And so it was not as effective as they had hoped it would be. And so that wasn't really uh, as disruptive as they had hoped. And then NotPetya, I think, was wildly successful beyond what they had expected it would be. Um, it spread uh, outside of Ukraine into uh, global companies, and it caused disruption in shipping and chocolate and all kinds of other places, uh, critical infrastructure. Um, chocolate, not just being clear about that. Um, and then October 17, we see Bad Rabbit hit. Uh, which wasn't quite as impactful, but it was, again, disruptive and, and meant to look like uh, a ransom attack. Uh, we see PS Crypt in January 2018, and we see Olympic Destroyer in, uh, in February 2018, which uh, we could probably do a whole other lightning session on, or maybe even a full-length session. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, uh, at the end of the day, there's a, a lot of activity from this one actor uh, that shows that they've uh, been involved in disruptive and destructive attacks. So coming back to the uh, SBU warning that went out on uh, October uh, 12, 20, 2017, why would they put out a warning? Well, I think that they understood what the, uh, what the implications were. Uh, NotPetya was uh, Ukraine Constitution Day, if, uh, if I remember correctly. And uh, October was Defender of the Ukraine Day. And so they understood that the uh, Ukrainian holidays, the things that uh, were important to people of Ukraine, uh, the, the power going out in December of 2015 and 2016 closer to the uh, Christian uh, Christmas holiday versus Orthodox Christian uh, Christmas holiday, um, all celebrated more pr predominantly in Western Ukraine. They understood how to disrupt Ukraine, how to get into the psyche of the people of Ukraine. I see you. Um, and, um, and so they knew that on uh, Ukraine Defender Day 2018 that it was possible that uh, there would be an attack very much as there had been for U uh, Ukraine Constitution Day, uh, which was around the time of NotPetya. So um, yeah, basically, uh, I have one minute left. So here's my free gift to you, uh, roadmap of things. <laughs> things to care about, but right, so when we think about how do we use all of this threat intelligence that we've been talking about and that we research and eat and drink and uh, mostly drink every day, um, you know, this type of stuff helps us conceptualize how to get in front of these types of events, or as they like to say in the, the government military space to the left of boom. Um, think about, you know, these types of events, 
how the adversary is going to use these to their uh, advantage. And you know, as we start to see escalating tensions as ships are bumping into each other in the Sea of Azov and, and things like that, you know, these are some of the dates that we should be keeping in mind that they might want to use to uh, really negatively impact the, uh, the, the people and the, 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 you know, the psyche of the Ukrainian people. All right, I have just a few more slides. No. <laughs> Thanks.